Today we're going to be discussing the main things to consider when designing a linear lighting system for your church. Join me as I chat with Greg Higgins, the Director of Innovation at Environmental Lights. Hi, I'm Richard Heaton, lighting designer at Paragon 360, and today we have Greg Higgins with us from Environmental Lights. Thanks for joining us, Greg. Thanks for having me, Richard. It's so great to be back. I'm excited to uh, dive into our topic of the day. Yeah, we're really going to pull the curtain back and dive into tips and tricks for linear lighting. Awesome. Well, there's a lot out there, and I get a ton of questions on a daily basis, and sometimes it's the most simple things that uh, get us stopped on these projects, and I, I want to help everybody uh, to kind of get past those things, and yeah. I think we can do that. Could we start by just defining what is linear lighting? Sure. Linear lighting is, is fairly simplistic. It's really a strip of LEDs all lined up together. Now, the cool thing about linear lighting is that it has evolved so much since 10 years ago when I started working in environmental lights. And now, rather than having a single color of LED diodes across that entire strip, now we can change the full colors, so red, green, blue, uh, red, green, blue, white, red, green, blue, color tunable, and then now there's a six in one. So we're able to, just on this linear strip, have so many different combinations of color. And then one more thing is that now we've added pixel to the mix where we can do all of those fantastic colors and we can control each and every single LED. So there's a lot more to linear strip lighting than one might think when they dive into the, I'm gonna design something with linear lights in it these days. Right, so when we're designing systems using these tools, uh, there's some common things to consider for each project, each job, each circumstance. Let's start with something that's hotly debated. <laughs> Which is better, 12 or 24 volts? Yikes. So really what I say when people ask me this question, and I get it so much, is frankly it's just going to depend on your, uh, your project. So I have done amazing, incredible projects with 12 volts, and I've done amazing with 24 volts. Here's the big difference. With 12 volt strip lights, their cutting increments are usually half the number of LEDs that with a 24. So that gives 12 volts a little bit of advantage if you're looking for really tight cut segments. However, with 24 volts, you have an advantage because you can run longer distances for two reasons, really. One, your cut increments are double. And two, you have 24 volts that you're working with, so your voltage drop is less throughout the line. So as much as I want to say there's a even uh, all out winner here, there's really not. And what I recommend is let's start with the project and find out what light's going to be the best and then from there we can choose between 12 and 24 volts. Fortunately, that's, yeah, that's, we, all, we have good answers for both. Yeah, that's kind of what we do is we, we figure out what is that, that special length there. Uh, what, are, what are we trying to do with the tape? Mm -hmm. Now let's choose a tape that will run that distance. Absolutely, and I think that's the best approach. Well, now that we've settled that debate between 12 and 24 volts, let's talk about one of the issues that some people run into when they don't consider voltage drop. Can you talk to us about the length of wire that we can get away with between a power supply and the LED tape? Without a doubt. And I'm really happy you posed the question with voltage drop and wire <laughs> length. And really, it's, we, we consider voltage drop first, but there's also two other parasitic loads that we have to take into consideration. So uh, the short answer to your question is you want to stick to 25 feet or less. Now within that 25 feet, of course, we want to make sure that we um, negotiate for voltage drop by making sure we've got thick enough wire. But now if we were go deeper into that answer, there are two other parasitic loads, mm -hmm. it's capacitance and inductance. And those are important because if you start to exceed that 25 feet length, then you get parasitic capacitance. And that creates, if you're dimming your lights using pulse width modulation, or basically chopping your voltage, you get voltage spikes and those voltage spikes can damage your strip. Now, it doesn't look like they're being damaged. They don't get any brighter, but over an extended period of time, a month or maybe a year, essentially they wear out. The next parasitic load is called inductance, and that's the, uh, es essentially the resistance of a circuit to change voltage from zero to 24, 24 to zero. And essentially what you get there is rather than a perfect spike up as you cut your voltage, it's a bit of a slope. So as your dimming levels go down, and your slope increases because you've got longer distances, then what happens is you start to see lights flicker a little bit. And so, again, the short answer to your question, stick to 25 feet, um, give your lighting designer a call if you need to go past that, and then we'll talk about gotcha. it. I think the important lesson here is 
if we want our product and install to last as long as possible, and we all do, uh, the shorter the distance, the better between the power supply and the linear light. You're without a doubt correct, and that's music to my ears. Now, there's a couple caveats. Uh -huh. The first caveat is with the Revy product line, all those products uh, are constant current. And with those, we dim them in a different way that doesn't chop the voltage. Mm -hmm. And with those products, we're capable of doing branch, or uh, I guess wire lengths up to 200 feet, 150 feet. Right. Another caveat is Environmental Lights just released a couple of power supplies for monochrome lights, single color strip lights, that is constant current reduction. Or, and what that does is that, or constant voltage reduction. And what that does is the same way of dimming it, but without the chopping. And that we use it with a lot of linear lights in residential circumstances where we need to remotely uh, locate that power supply. And those you can run 150, 200 feet, but we do have to still make sure that we're paying attention to voltage drop. Right, so there's another consideration, branch length limits. What are branch length limits? Really good question. So just like our wire lengths, our strip uh, has voltage drop within it too. Now fortunately, Environmental Lights engineers all of our strips so that as long as they're receiving um, close to the voltage that they're designed to operate at, 12 volts or 24 volts, at either 11 and a half volts or 23 volts, as long as they're getting that voltage in, into it, then you can run those full lengths of strip uh, and not have any dimming from the beginning of the strip to the end of the strip. Now, we designed it up to the end of the strip, and we call that a branch length limit because if you go past that branch length limit, or you extend on to the end of a strip, essentially what happens is you start to see the effects of voltage drop. And that can happen one of two ways. Either you've got a single color light that starts to dim, or what's more obvious is you've got a color changing light that starts to shift color. Like a purple looks like a pink or a blue towards the end of it. Right, so if one of our viewers was to take a piece of tape and then install another piece of tape on the end of that and solder them together or yeah. wire them together, connect them in whatever way, they're going to run into those problems. Without a doubt. And it's so tempting to do sometimes because you can save on power supplies, of course. Um, but the best thing to do is power from the center and go out if you've got long distances. Uh, another thing is that it might look okay. It may look okay until you put another strip at the end of that. And then you'll see like this zigzag effect of bright, bright, dim, bright, bright, dim. And it looks really bad and it's not great for the power supply or the very end of that strip. So Greg, sometimes I'll have someone call and they say, how bright does my light need to be? I, how many lumens is enough? Well, you should tell those people that they're in good company because that's a really difficult question to ask if we don't know what lumens are and you know, it's, it's almost right. hieroglyphics to us all. And so what I do with our, our new sales engineers and even when I'm talking to customers is if we can make an association with something that you and I know, that's the best way to do it. And I, and I apply that moving forward. So let's take a kitchen, for example. Mm -hmm. In a kitchen, you've got under cabinet lights, which are task lights. You really want those to be able to work underneath them and you know, read letters and um, see colors perfectly. Then you also have some accent lighting in your kitchen, so above the cabinets. Not quite as bright as the task lighting, but bright enough to get your ceiling. And then you also have the lights inside the, let's say, glass cabinets. Now those can be fairly dim. We don't need to, we're not reading inside They're just those. kind of a highlight. Exactly, and we may not even need to dim them. So if we look at those three areas and we start with the, the dimmest. So inside the kitchen cabinet lights, and again, we're gonna apply this to whatever it is we're doing and whatever the location is, zero to, probably not zero, but 750 lumens and below is uh -huh. perfectly fine for that. Now, when we look at the lights, let's say above the kitchen cabinets that we're gonna shine either like onto a cove or uh, up onto the ceiling, about 750 to 1,000 is perfectly fine for that. Um, and then next, we're going to look at the task lighting. So task lighting, anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500 lumens is great. That's when you're really getting into the detail. Um. Without a doubt. You're also washing your backsplash, and it's, that light is typically um, a key element in the kitchen when it comes to the lighting. And so you really want a bit of light down there to do your, um, your tasks that you're doing in the kitchen. Now there's one other set of lights and just super bright. Mm -hmm. And anything in linear that's over, let's say 1500 lumens is very, very bright. And really the intent of those is a couple things. Sometimes we're washing a wall and we need to get up a few feet onto that wall. Um, and then sometimes we just need it extremely bright and then we're gonna dim it down, like say throughout the day uh, within a cove or something. 
Um, and then we have a lot of like general random use cases for the very, very bright stuff. But I would say a general rule is the kitchen. Uh, use those, so 750 and then 750 to 1,000 for the you know, stuff above, and then uh, 1,000 to 1,500 for task lighting, and then 1,500 plus if you're really looking to blast something. Gotcha. And how about control? Let's uh, talk about DMX real quick for those people who might not be familiar with DMX. Sure, yeah. So DMX is maybe one of my favorite things in the world, and that's probably one of the nerdiest things an engineer could ever say. <laughs> <laughs> and what DMX is, is it's a light, it's a language, it's a lighting protocol. And the way that I look at DMX is, uh, it's, well, a couple things. DMX is a standard protocol, which I love because it, so many people write things for the DMX language so that uh, you have cross capabilities from your control consoles mm -hmm. to uh, like our Revy product line or onto the linear lighting. Um, so DMX is a lighting, it's a digital lighting control language. Uh, a couple things about DMX is it's, uh, it's a data that's passed serially, meaning we can only send that data in one direction. One direction Ex and only for a certain distance. Exactly. And the funny thing is, is what happens at the end of that direction? It falls off into infinity. Doesn't bounce back if we've done our things right. If, <laughs> yeah, that's correct. We don't get yeah. reflection back into our system, but it just goes off and you, it's, it's linear. And I say linear and why is that important? Because we'll have on occasion uh, someone that wants to split DMX in two directions. Yep, I've say, gotten those phone calls too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I say, oh, we'll just uh, uh, wire nut a couple of our DMX lines will just go in two directions. Well, that doesn't work out well. You get really bad data as it goes down. You get data reflection as it comes back. And it's just not uh, a, a smart thing to do or, or a wise thing. It may seem like the right thing to do at the time, but I would avoid it. Um, data is, or DMX is very robust. So it allows us to control 512 unique channels uh, and at levels of 0 to 255 meaning by sending a, um, a DMX signal, I can control 512 individual lights at 255 different light levels. So it's very, very powerful, it's very cool. Um, a couple other things about DMX is you are right about that length. Yeah, you can't, can't run it forever. <laughs> no, no. And there's a couple limitations that I look at with DMX. The first limitation is, okay, how many devices can I pass this data through uh, before I need to start worrying about you know data degradation or basically my data getting flubbed up, very similar to when we play the game telephone. Right, right, <laughs> right. Because every time the DMX touches a device, mm -hmm. uh, there's just a little bit of loss right there. There's there's that that you you had mentioned not running um, the data in a, a spider web fashion it, serially. Correct. Uh, one of the reasons why is because once that data hits that chain and drops down there, there is a reflection that comes back. Mm -hmm. So the longer that distance is, is detrimental to the integrity of the signal as it travels on. Mm -hmm. But even though a, a signal might stop at one device, there's still just a little bit of loss right yep. there. So there's a, a limit on the, on the number of devices. Without a doubt. And if you look Wikipedia, if you Google search it, it's going to say DMX's theoretical limit is 32 devices and period. But what I always tell our sales engineers and anybody, our customers, is 32 is the theoretical limit. Well, my car has a theoretical limit and the speedometer, but I'm not going to push that. So I typically say stick to 20 devices and under. And then if you start to get north of 20 devices, then it's time to talk to Richard. It's time to give your environmental lights sales engineer a call. And then we'll start to look at, take a closer look at the system to make sure that we're putting in uh, the redundancies that we need to go past uh, 20 fixtures or 25 fixtures. There are much easier things to do to work around that stuff yeah. uh, as well. And some of the com common problems that uh, people will have if they, if they don't follow these rules. Uh, flickering. Yes, flickering. Um, and the funny thing about DMX is that the flickering that you see is oftentimes not the problematic device. And so a lot of times the problematic device or the problem is somewhere else in the system, but you see the, um, the flickering in another part of the system. So you'll have a, um, a lighting guy there scratching his head looking at a device here, but it's because they ran 40 fixtures in a series and it has nothing to do with that single light. Um, that brings up another uh, limitation to DMX, and that's you know, how much wire do I want to run 
from my counsel to you know the end of all those devices. Right. And what I tell people is if you're running CAT cable, CAT5, CAT6E, first and foremost make sure it's shielded. Typically in these lighting environments there's electricity all over the place and there's EM interference that can penetrate those cable lines if they're not shielded. Second is if you're running CAT cable, try to stick to 300 feet or below. And that's the sum between your controller or your console and the end of those lines. And I know that seems like it's limiting CAT cable because it's technically capable of doing 1,000 feet. But for DMX, it's a fairly rudimentary data protocol. And I always think it's better to be on the conservative sign, side and to not have to, on you know, studio day, uh, try to troubleshoot when you're doing that. So stick to 300 feet. And if you want to go past, then give Richard a call or give uh, Environmental Lights a call. And we'll take a look at the system and make sure we're you know, covering all those redundancies. So there's one more component that we try not to leave out of any of our systems, and that's channel with diffuser. Oh, glad you brought it up. Yeah. Uh, so uh, channel systems, as we call it, environmental lights, are ex essentially uh, aluminum profiles that are extruded. And channel systems are incredibly helpful for a handful of reasons. Primarily, first and foremost, you don't see it. They dissipate heat. The heat. Yes, the color of tape. It pulls the heat away from the strip, especially those really high output strips, and it uh, helps to, I guess, through convection, get that heat away from those lights, which is a good thing. And the diffusion. Yes, the diffusion is the second thing. And what the diffusion does is, if you've got an LED strip light, uh, even with the highly um, uh, a high pitch of LEDs, you can use a diffuser to really knock down the diffuser. You don't see the hot spots. So the final takeaway for someone who is dipping their toes into the water of linear lighting, Mm -hmm. uh, what's a couple of major points that you would really stress to these people? I think I can give you three main points. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, first, we just talked about it, you know, don't forget aluminum diffusers or aluminum right. channel systems. Those are really helpful. Um, two is lighting design services. Paragon 360 does such a phenomenal job with the creating uh, immersive experiences with the lighting design so that as a purchaser or as an end user, you don't feel like you're um, kind of a fish out of water designing lighting systems. With uh, lighting designs, you know exactly the effect that you're going to get. Environmental Lights also offers the same services um, for our customers as well. So lighting design services take advantage of those. And I think that leads nicely into maybe the third and most important. Mm -hmm. And that is, I think that all of our customers and Paragon 360's customers should take advantage of their resources. And their resources are us. Richard, you guys do such a phenomenal job with your designs. You guys are so knowledgeable about your products. And we pride ourselves in our product knowledge as well. And we really like to be involved with projects early on so that we can turn those visions into a reality, just like you guys do so well here at Paragon 360. So number three, use your resources. We're here to help. Oh, and you've got great resources. Thank you very much. We, we work really hard on those. To learn more about Environmental Light's amazing products, check out our recent video on the Revy system or visit them at environmentallights.com. And if you need help designing your next lighting system, reach out to us at info at paragon360.com. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next video.